Dear participants of the third executive model OIC and model OIC 2020 International Relations Academy, I would like to greet you all on behalf of the Eurasian Regional Center of ICYF. That project is being implemented by ICYF ERC in the partnership with the Ministry of Youth and Sports of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Today, our joint guest is His Excellency Mr. Ambassador Hazar Ibrahim, Ambassador of the Republic of Azerbaijan to the Republic of Turkey. We would like to thank His Excellency for accepting our invitation. Um, we are sorry for any technical issues that we suffered during the starting of the live stream. So His Excellency, you may start. After the end of this uh, lecture, uh, our participants will have a chance to ask a question to the His Excellency. Thank you, His Excellency, for joining us today. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank the ICYF, ICYF Eurasian Regional Center, as well as the Ministry of uh, Sports and Youth of the Republic of Azerbaijan for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, we all live through the very difficult times. Even technology seems to be affected by the pandemic, so therefore we start a little bit late. I don't want to take too much time since we have already lost some. I will try to be as brief as possible and from my perspective uh, we can actually learn from each other because we're all coming from different regions and also it would give us the opportunity to be more interactive. Uh, indeed, these are very difficult times uh, we're going through. The COVID-19 pandemics uh, made everything actually changed. Uh, it's changing the world, it's changing the nature of international relations. And it was so unexpected that nobody really, I think, has a clear cut contingency plan, how to get out of it or how things will look like afterwards. Even the nature of the embassy work, ambassadorial work uh, is dramatically changing. Uh, in the last one and a half, almost two months, uh, we have been dealing at the embassy almost exclusively on COVID-19 issue, uh, starting from evacuation of our citizens, providing them with the assistance, uh, getting the medical supplies for our hospitals, uh, procedural issues, counselor issues, many, many, many other traditional um, embassy works have changed in their nature, or rather have been adjusted uh, to the current realities. And also the communications. Uh, before it was mostly human to human communication, and now we're all going through Zoom, Skype, WhatsApp, or many other technological tools uh, to get in touch with each other, to share our uh, ideas. How it will change, how it will evolve, nobody knows. Uh, previously, the good relations between the diplomats was a key for solving many issues. And to forge it uh, from the diplomatic practice, you have to have personal relations. And now, through technology, well, you have to find different ways to do that. When it will end, how it will evolve again, uh, nobody uh, knows. And from another side, the, the, this, this, this pandemic is creating a huge debate about the future, the future of our world, the future of the interstate relations, uh, the future of the nature of the countries per se, uh, about openness versus closeness, uh, how we, how we, what we choose, how we... Uh, move our nations forward. There is a case of Sweden, for example, and some other countries uh, which decided not to uh, lock down the country and rather keep it more or less open uh, with its own uh, outcomes. At the same time, there is a rather more widespread approach when uh, the countries close not only their borders, but also put basically most of their population or almost all of them until there's some kind of either self-quarantine or state-enforced uh, quarantine. Uh, so there, there will be debate in future also, depending uh, what will be the 
clear-cut result, which is better in that sense, uh, openness, closeness. Uh, from another side, also, uh, what is better, national approach or rather international approach? Because some countries uh, do have some resources uh, to tackle the issue from medical point of view. Nobody has 100% of the things, uh, otherwise we'll have already solved the issue. Uh, but some have resources, they have good research facilities, uh, they have uh, skilled, not only medical workers, but also uh, health officials knowing how to navigate uh, the health system. Some others do not have these resources. Uh, I am in Turkey right now in the brotherly nation to Azerbaijan and for example, Turkey is providing assistance to uh, more than 50 countries because it has very strong uh, production sector which produces a lot of stuff needed for the medical workers starting from the masks and ending up with uh, some other protective things. Uh, so therefore there is a debate, uh, should you in future put your economy in a way when you can ensure that nationally, domestically, you would be able to produce things which would be needed during this kind of crisis, or rather you cooperate and be more international uh, to ensure the supply chain. Uh, again, it will all depend on the uh, on the uh, on the outcome of the of of the of the uh, pandemic, uh, what uh, for example, right now you see uh, I talked about technology. So I am on my with my iPad. I have my phone here. I have other phones around me, and I'm getting messages from everywhere. That's also a different situation. So it's just uh, one of the uh, examples of that. Uh, another thing which uh, many, many countries will have to consider in future after pandemics end, and I'm quite optimistic that at some point, maybe uh, not very soon, but at some point we'll, uh, we'll get over it, will be the alliances and partnerships between the countries. Uh, so, so we should be very careful in looking into the traditional alliances and partnerships. Uh, for example, Europe is uh, the hardest hit continent on, uh, on, on, on COVID-19. Uh, there is European Union, there is NATO, uh, which are the, the major bulks of the alliances uh, in the continent. Uh, but there were huge debates, especially Italy versus uh, some European officials, Spain versus some European officials, uh, in terms of uh, who, how supported uh, the very hard hit countries. And then other major powers uh, jumped in in order to find their own space. So afterwards, what these alliances look like uh, is also a big question. Um, I don't think that uh, they will fade away. I don't think they will be much weaker. No, but probably there will be some adjustments. <laughs> so bilateral relations of some European countries with outside powers would definitely influence <coughs> their uh, traditional alliances and uh, partnerships. So these are all the unknown changing uh, variables, but there are also some uh, constant variables uh, in this uh, unexpected situation. And one of them is uh, the relations uh, between some uh, countries which have not been affected in any sense, in any ways, even during this crisis. And I think one of the good examples would be the relations between my home country, Azerbaijan, and the country where I serve, Republic of uh, Turkey. And I think it's, it's, it's a real constant variable because during this crisis, we managed uh, the very notion of one nation, two state to even further forge in tackling uh, this, uh, these pandemics. We had expertise sharing, we had 
uh, medical cooperation, we had consular support to each other in order to let citizens of both countries uh, to move back and forth. Uh, we had to deal with some issues uh, rather through non-official channels, which also worked perfectly. So nothing has changed, uh, despite many bilateral relations of other countries changed. And I think it could be a good example, uh, one of the very good examples, especially for our region to, uh, to see, to learn, and to broaden maybe the scope uh, scope uh, after the uh, pandemics. Uh, the three key factors, I think, which helped uh, Turkey-Azerbaijan uh, relations to withstand this uh, unnatural pressure is one, predictability. Uh, the relations of, between two countries are very predictable. Uh, we have perfect relations between the leadership, we have very cordial relation between the nations. Every year, all the service, both in Azerbaijan and Turkey, put uh, each country on the very top, on the really, really very top of the uh, of the allies for each each nations, around 80, 90 percent. Uh, and uh, we all know that whatever happens, uh, there will be no changes. So we are uh, living through this uh, very uh, notion of predictable relations. The second thing is maximalism in a good sense. Well, sometimes maximalistic goals do not help us, especially in diplomacy. Uh, but uh, in terms of Turkey Azerbaijan relations, the, this maximalism is helping us a lot. What I mean by that is we always tried to move our relations as further as possible. Despite the fact that uh, relations between Turkey and Azerbaijan are absolutely unmatched by any bilateral uh, relation standards, uh, be it in terms of economy, energy relations, political, defense, cultural, and every single uh, uh, sphere. Uh, but what I mean by uh, maximalism is that we're never satisfied. We're never satisfied with what we have, and we're always trying to reach more. As an example, for example, uh, every year we have around 40% increase in our, uh, in our trade, in our bilateral trade. But again, every year during the top meetings, during the top summits, our presidents put even higher, much higher goals for us to achieve and we, uh, we try our best to move forward. Uh, politically, we are so close, but again, every year we uh, try to make them as uh, deep as possible, for example, in the international arena. Uh, we started, uh, for example, how bilateral relations evolved in trilateral formats in the region. For example, uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran, uh, plus Pakistan, Ukraine, and others. And that became uh, a good example. But again, maximizing our goals allows us to broaden uh, the very scope of our regional affairs. And the third thing, um, and I will, uh, I will probably stop here in order again uh, to listen more of your questions and try, and, and, and try to answer uh, from your interest perspective, is the way I started actually. The Turkey-Azerbaijan relations, and it might sound a little bit frightening, but in fact it's really good, it's contagious. It's really contagious because uh, a lot of countries in the region, as I mentioned, they try to learn from us. They try to learn uh, when they see that how we solve the issues. From my embassy work perspective, uh, very often it happens that, for example, the entire diplomatic community here, we have one issue we have to solve. And many countries, the embassies, they approach us and say, well, maybe you will step up and ask our Turkish hosts here, uh, which would then spread to them too. And that happens uh, on many, many, many areas. Uh, and again, on the regional format, uh, when we started, sometimes we started uh, trilateral cooperation, as I mentioned, trilateral formats. Then, they said, then other countries came in and said, why don't we move it 
and expand it uh, further and make it uh, four countries or even five countries or having other regional formats. So therefore, Turkey and Azerbaijan relations are really contagious and it's spreading around. And I think OIC and the OIC area could be one of the uh, areas, uh, one of the geographic uh, regions uh, where this contagious nature of the, in a good sense, between Turkey and Azerbaijan can have a really positive effect. So I thank you very much, and I, I will be happy to entertain your questions. Um, thank you a lot, His Excellency, uh, for delivering this beautiful lecture. As you talked about this uh, trilateral cooperation, our participant from Iran is asking one question about this iran azerbaijan turkey partnership so question is that iran turkey and azerbaijan have agreed to use local currencies for trade and commercial transactions during the sixth tri trilateral meeting considering the decision would protect the economic relations of these three countries against external interference has this decision implemented yet and also and has this pandemic given one more evidence that we need to invest in such regional systems, regional corporations? It's a really good question. Um, yeah, again, you see, I, I was right when I thought that we should do it more interactive because uh, this kind of interesting and <coughs> quite actual questions will come up. Uh, there were deliberations about using the uh, national currencies in our trade, uh, but definitely COVID-19 uh, will influence not only monetary policies, not only the trade relations, it will change uh, absolutely everything. Uh, look, what we're having now, uh, for example, both Azerbaijan and Iran are among the uh, major energy producers. Uh, Iran is, is much larger, of course, in that sense. Uh, what is the price, uh, what is the cost uh, of the uh, uh, hydrocarbons today? It's very different from uh, what we had before COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, the currencies, uh, not only of the regional countries, but many others, uh, especially those uh, at the developing countries, are being um, highly affected and they will probably be further affected uh, as far as, as long as the pandemic uh, continues. Uh, the very nature of trade will change. Uh, for example, now between Azerbaijan and Turkey, uh, despite all the negative effects pandemic has, uh, for example, Baku Tbilisi Cars Railroad, which we have between our countries, which links Europe and Asia, uh, actually trans transactions and transit uh, triple uh, uh, through Baku Tbilisi Cars uh, Railroad. Uh, how it will work uh, through the borders, uh, all these uh, procedures, probably there will be new procedures in trade. Uh, what will be the fate of even the major currencies in the world is highly unknown because they will be also affected by the global trade. They will be also affected by the price of oil and natural gas. So uh, before answering the question, uh, can we use our national currencies in the trade among three friendly uh, countries in the region, we should first answer the questions how the global trade uh, and the status of the major currencies look like. Uh, so therefore everything will be linked and nobody can have a clear cut answer to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, next question is also about Turkey Azerbaijan trade relations, as you mentioned in your speech for now. The question about, on the 25th of February 2020, Turkey and Azerbaijan signed a trade deal worth $15 billion to be achieved by 2023. But now due to COVID-19, there is a possibility that it may not be achieved due to economic crisis. So despite the crisis, is Mr. Ambassador still thinking that after the pandemic, this deal will be made possible at the same period of time? Uh, good question, but uh, it was not a deal. Um, on February 25th, it, there was a high-level strategic council meeting in Baku, uh, led by two presidents of the countries. I was also present there. It was not a deal to uh, 
tr it was not a trade deal uh, in that sense uh, for 15 billion uh, US dollars. It was the goal set um, in several years to achieve the trade uh, uh, reaching 15 billion because uh, trade is around 4.5 billion uh, right now between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, but I would not be so skeptical uh, if we cannot achieve it. Uh, and I'll explain why. Because nobody knows, again, we live in a very unpredictable world. Uh, So-called experts, many of them can predict one thing and then we'll go and see where there are very different out outcomes. Again, who would have imagined that there will be a triple uh, tripling of the transit capacity of Bakut Kulisi cars during the pandemics. Uh, and it's also one of the tools for the trade. And it links to huge regions, uh, continents, actually. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, uh, which areas, uh, which spheres of economy will be prioritized afterwards? Maybe they would allow even increased trades beyond of the plans we had. Um, it's, it's, it's really impossible to say. If somebody tells you that it will go down uh, or somebody will uh, picture a very bright future, uh, both will be wrong or maybe both will be right. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, the most important thing is just to keep going, uh, just to find, as you asked in the beginning, uh, to fine tune our cooperation and Turkey and Azerbaijan have, again, unmatched a uh, basis uh, for moving things forward. So maybe I will put myself in a more optimistic uh, side. Uh, again, I can be wrong, but I think if we put more efforts, uh, we can actually increase our trade. And also uh, on February 25th, there was uh, not trade agreement, but preferential, preferential uh, trade uh, deal signed between uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan, which would allow for certain items uh, to be preferentially exported and imported between these countries. Maybe that would allow us uh, to increase the uh, trade volume as well. Um, thank you, His Excellency. <coughs> I'm pretty sure that some of participants, especially from Azerbaijan, made the research about your background and they saw that you have worked in the NATO as a delegation, Azerbaijan delegation to the NATO, yes. That's why they are asking about the question of the NATO Turkey relations. Especially mm -hmm. after the, uh, the Turkish operation in the northern Syria, some NATO member states, some public opinions in the NATO member states became against Turkey and they started that we should withdraw Turkey from the NATO. So they would like to ask and uh, learn your opinion about that. Yeah, I have my personal opinion that yes, I did work there. I, I, I was the head of our mission uh, to NATO. Uh, I do not believe in changing dramatically the nature of relations of Turkey with NATO. And it's impossible actually, because Turkey is uh, one of the major allies uh, within this alliance. Uh, of course, there was an effect of ballet. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, there was some cut in communication, so I will repeat what I said probably if you <coughs> haven't heard. Can you hear me? I cannot hear you, right? But I cannot hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, now I can. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will repeat. Uh, I don't believe in, in a change in Turkey and NATO relations because Turkey is a major ally. Actually, it's one of the <laughs> most major allies uh, within NATO. Uh, it's unimaginable even to think about NATO without uh, Turkey or, for example, United States. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, Turkey is so much entrenched into the uh, NATO affairs, so most of the current geopolitical issues where NATO is involved cannot be solved or even tackled uh, without Turkey. Uh, second point is, well, Turkey is a sovereign nation. Uh, Turkey is a regional power. Turkey has its own national interests, and Turkey uh, moves first of all and conducts its policies based on its own national interests and vital interests. And uh, some other NATO members might have contradictory uh, national interests in the regions where Turkey is involved. 
that's also normal. I don't believe that that would affect uh, Turkey's role at NATO. It might affect or probably affects a little bit bilateral relations. Uh, but uh, anyways, I think uh, they will be fine-tuned and it will not affect uh, deeply uh, the, the Turkish stance uh, in NATO. <coughs> Thank you, His Excellency. Next question is from Egypt. The question is about in 2017, Turkey and Azerbaijan signed a memorandum of understanding for cooperation in higher education. But as of today, it seems like Turkey is the one of the benefiting the most. How effective is it? This memorandum of understanding. Well, I don't. I don't know uh, uh, why Turkey is benefiting more. Uh, probably the point is, uh, I yes, memorandum of understanding. I remember that. Uh, um, it's a really good uh, memorandum uh, which allows quality education, and I want to underline quality education uh, for Azerbaijani students in Turkey and also Turkish students in Azerbaijan. Right now we have, uh, and it's a huge number, we have uh, up to 22,000 Azerbaijani students in Turkey. And we have up to 5,000 Turkish students uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, so from that perspective, maybe uh, the question asked about benefiting, yes, maybe in, from monetary perspective, so most of the people that maybe yeah, Turkey is benefiting more. But I think given the nature of our relations, which are brotherly, again, one nation, two states, I think we are benefiting both. I, our students do not feel foreign in Turkey, and also Turkish students in Azerbaijan, uh, they feel home. So from that perspective, we're both uh, benefiting. The major point, actually one of the major points, and I want to state it uh, openly, and I hope that our Azerbaijani students uh, also take it seriously and also tell their friends, one of the major points uh, within that memorandum of understanding was uh, about the diplomas they received. Unfortunately, we had a lot of cases uh, when students from both countries were coming uh, to study at some universities, both in Turkey and Azerbaijan, because they couldn't go, couldn't go through the normal testing process. And without good scores, um, um, they were they couldn't get the education basically. So they were finding other ways. Let me be quite open. Uh, you know, I have always been very open uh, with uh, our students uh, and I hope that they understand because it's uh, for the good. We again have- uh, Video is shut down. The voice is- Yeah, yeah I, will, I, will, I will just push it. I think that factory is low. Thank you. Hold on for a second, let me see, yeah. Yeah, I think now it's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the point is that unfortunately many were coming through other ways, and uh, through this memorandum of understanding, uh, we had a, uh, we had an agreement that their diplomas will be accepted in uh, either country only after they go through the normal process. And I think it's quite fair because both Turkey and Azerbaijan we need educated people, not those who just come here. Uh, for other purposes. <coughs> yes, His Excellency, you are totally right. I know this issue as well. Thank you for clarification. Thank you. The next question from Pakistan. Uh, the question is, is about that Azerbaijan enjoying very good relations with Turkey's, Turkey. At the same time, uh, Azerbaijan has good relations with the Saudi Arabia. But for Pakistani participant, there is obvious reason that uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey is kind of rivalries have a rivalry between themselves. So what is the role of Azerbaijan in this rivalry? How Azerbaijan maintain balance relationship with Saudi Arabia and Turkey at the same time? Yeah, we, we don't look at it as a rivalry. There could be some disagreements or some issues between any countries uh, in the world, close, big, small, doesn't matter. Um, whenever there are uh, issues between uh, the countries with which Azerbaijan enjoys good relations, but they have uh, some uh, temporary uh, setbacks, we always try to help and of course uh, uh, we also uh, tried to smoothen uh, the, let's say, some misunderstandings which have occurred on some issues uh, between, uh, between, uh, between Turkey and Saudi Arabia or 
uh, to that sense, uh, among some other uh, nations where we could offer our diplomatic and uh, good uh, services. Yes, thank you, His Excellency. The next question is about the role of international organizations in the post-pandemic world. Uh, how do you see the future of international politics during the post-pandemic era? There are already claims that the states will focus on more bilateral relations rather than alliances, as some unions or alliances fail to struggle against COVID-19 pandemic collectively. Uh, even within the same union, one state confiscated the health medical devices or equipment designed for another one. So maybe it is from the European Union example. So how do you see the future of these international organizations and the role of nation states? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, uh, this, I also uh, mentioned about that in the beginning. So what will be the nature, how it will change? Just a second. I apologize. I think we are a little bit. We have some issues with uh, charging on my iPad, so I will ask it to. No worries, no worries. That's in order not to have a shutdown. Uh, it will affect definitely. Uh, uh, that's a short answer. How it will affect, that's another question, and it's a good question to pose from right now. Uh, well, the pandemic started in China. Well, let's, let's put the pieces, uh, small pieces down. It started in China. China is a P5 member of UN Security Council, right? And uh, everybody thought that it will be issue only for uh, China probably its neighbors, and it became global pandemic. Then China was first to come clean out of this uh, mess. Now China actually helping others uh, who are more affected today than China used to be. Now, another small piece is how it will affect its stance, for example, at the United Nations, the only universal organization we have in the world. Uh, from another side, how it will affect, for example, uh, the role of the United States, uh, which is a superpower, but from another side is by far, by far uh, the worst affected country on the pandemic and actually is getting some assistance uh, from other countries. Uh, so the answer to your question will be, we'll look first um, into the big power uh, matrix, uh, how they will be poised after the pandemics. Uh, secondly, it will come down to some regional powers, like Turkey, for example, what will be their stance. Uh, for example, it revealed also the very strong parts of Turkey, uh, providing assistance to more than 50 countries, some of the much larger and economically stronger uh, shows uh, Turkish strengths. Uh, uh, that will be interesting to see, uh, the, the role of the regional powers. And three, uh, well, uh, the, again, the third, I think, variable we should take into consideration is the very notion of uh, the question mark, I will put it this way. Because nobody knows what will happen. Nobody would have predicted that we'll have this situation uh, three or four months ago. Uh, maybe this COVID-19 uh, will mutate further. Maybe there will be some other side effects. We're seeing a lot of environmental uh, changes. Uh, we, by prediction of the most uh, economists and experts, uh, some industries actually will be obsolete. Some other industries on the contrary will go up how it will all change, how it will affect the nature of the nations. Again, how close or open will remain uh, the countries. That will be the third variable which would affect um, also the multilateral uh, sphere and the role of international organizations. Thank you, His Excellency. Next question from Azerbaijani participants. Uh, as you know, some members of the Turkish parliament, in namely the from the part of HDP, HDP 
some of their members take photos with the flags of the not recognized occupant regime in Azerbaijan, the de facto regime there, so called. So, what is the role of Embassy of Azerbaijan in Turkey with dealing with this kind of situations? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we had the case. We had the case before, and uh, the Turkish government was straightforward to interfere. And quite, uh, I think, interestingly, and I think it will be good for our audience to know, not only government but entire Turkish nation stood up and went against them. And I think they very much regretted uh, this mistake uh, because there was a lot of pressure uh, on them. Uh, but. Uh, Again, uh, we should be quite realistic. If we look, we can see that this party uh, was uh, in the forefront, not only of this kind of uh, provocations, but also provocations against the interests of Turkish Republic per se, and, and, and promoting separ separatism also within Turkey, as far as we can see from their policy declarations and some other things. And there is not a single other major political power in Turkey uh, which ever, which ever supported their ideas like this. So therefore, these provocations uh, happened. We cannot exclude them in future, uh, but there is clear-cut uh, position that both the government of Turkey and people of Turkey refuted that uh, in a very strong sense. Thank you very much. The next question is from Uzbekistan. Uh, are participants interested in the, your opinion about the future of Turkic Council? As you know, nowadays, uh, this council is very active. They are holding online summits within their yes. capacities. So what is the future of this council for you after this pandemic? Yeah, President Ilham Aliyev held the, because we are now chairing the Turkic Council, uh, he held the uh, video conference or video summit among the members of the Turkey Council, and uh, it was quite effective. They mostly discussed, of course, these pandemics and how we can cooperate together. Uh, Turkey Council is, I would say, is a rising star, but it will very much depend on our practical cooperation. There are many ideas how to make it more practical because we all know that previously it was mostly dealing with more cultural issues, more solidarity issues, but if we don't have uh, the real backbone of practical cooperation, uh, it will be very difficult to grow. So therefore, there are a lot of ideas how to promote, uh, for example, trade, economy, uh, even tourism. Uh, there were even some ideas, uh, I don't know how it will work out during the pandemics, but how to have joint uh, tourism efforts and some others. So we need to put some meat of practical cooperation into this very notion of solidarity in order to make the council uh, more effective and find its, uh, uh, find its place among the strongest international organizations. If you don't mind, I will take some questions as, as well so we can then conclude. The next question is from Pakistan. The question is about trilateral mechanism of Pakistan, Azerbaijan and Turkey. Our Pakistani participants worried about that this mechanism is not effective there, are, there is very big potential, but country is not willing to implement this potential. What do you think about the future of this trilateral mechanism that can be uh, bring together these countries to get more? No, I don't think it's uh, it's inefficient. Or maybe he's right in terms of we have much bigger potential, uh, but it will take time. Uh, uh, and uh, for example, we have. Uh, very uh, very well coordinated positions among three countries in international arena on global affairs. We always support each other on some key issues uh, for our national interests. And that's a good thing. And from another side, there are some areas where we're having good practical cooperations. Uh, uh, and uh, we have much many more plans uh, to develop further. Uh, of course, uh, Pakistan and Turkey are, are bigger countries than Azerbaijan, but um, and they have uh, their bilateral relations are bigger in in a scope. But um, Azerbaijan can contribute a lot uh, from its uh, own uh, perspective because we can actually be uh, the 
and the window for them uh, for the region. Uh, but I, I agree with the uh, with the participant that maybe we should think more and and a little bit deeper uh, into the tapping some other areas uh, which our potential, our real potential provides for us. <coughs> Thank you a lot. And the last question also from Azerbaijan. Uh, the question is about the recognition of Pajali genocide in Turkish government. So the participant asking that there is already a document issued by the National Assembly of Turkey, but should can we call it as official recognition of Pajali genocide or we can't? Well, official recognition of, of the Khojali genocide will be official when, uh, when it become official. So I, I repeated the word official three times. So it's official when it's official. Yes. Um, uh, if it's declaration, it is declaration. So there are different things and there is legal and diplomatic uh, substance uh, of this issue. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of Turkish uh, politicians, a lot of members of parliament openly call uh, what happened in Khojali uh, genocide uh, very openly and for the first time this year we even had a huge event with participation of the uh, speaker of the uh, Turkish parliament uh, where one of the members of parliament had a huge presentation about Khojali genocide he called it clearly he called on its recognition so there is more and more uh, inclination I see from my perspective, of course, we cannot interfere into the decision making uh, to recognize Khojali as a genocide. But you know, uh, uh, there are always double standards internationally and globally. And there are a lot of accusations against Turkey per se on the very notion and definition uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the term genocide. Uh, so therefore, uh, we also understand uh, why Turkish government and Turkish uh, foreign ministry is quite cautious in its every any step on the issues uh, which are uh, very sensitive. Thank you, His Excellency. Last one is not question about kind of how to say is your asking <coughs> opinion and asking your advice. Uh, there are a lot of participants who are studying international relations and diplomacy and they know that you are a professional diplomat who served in a, in a lot of countries and organizations. So they would like to ask you what will be your advice to them in the, in the way that to becoming a professional diplomat? It's, uh, it's, it's a good question, but it's <coughs> very different. Uh, if it's a question from Azerbaijani diplomats, or oh, Azerbaijani participants. Yes, <coughs> from Azerbaijanis. I, I wish them well, first of all. I hope they will contribute a lot in future into the foreign service and diplomacy of Azerbaijan. I grew in a different generation. I went through, uh, there was a question about Kojal. I lived through that, uh, that period. I lived through January 20th. Uh, uh, these are things which are changing your mindset. Uh, so uh, I had no choice. I, I, I didn't, well, I loved, I wanted to be a diplomat, but uh, I had more inclinations toward more technical things. I love math more uh, than uh, social sciences, for example. <coughs> I would have imagined myself being a scientist, uh, maybe. But these things have changed uh, when we see that our uh, economy is shattered, which is coming out of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, when we're being massacred, there are genocides against us, and the uh, international community is mostly calm. Uh, then you have no choice. You have to. Uh, to do something, you have to contribute. And uh, in my generation, uh, this was a natural strife uh, to become a diplomat or, or, or military guy to defend your country, be it on the battlefield, diplomatic battlefield or real uh, battlefield. Uh, and then, of course, you get good education um, and then you join foreign ministry. But the most important thing was you always keep your love for your country. If you lack this love, uh, you can be the smartest person in the world. You can be most educated. You will never be able to contribute as much as, uh, as, as possible to your country's foreign policy or its national interest. So my advice will be, first of all, always love your country. This is, it might sound simple, but it is, it is the backbone of it. And then with education, with many other things, uh, you can build on that. 
Uh, afterwards, of course, uh, you should not, uh, you should, with this love, when you go and present your countries, represent your countries uh, internationally, uh, it will be your pride that you are at least as educated as your counterparts. And then it's translation of your love for your country, representing it properly. Uh, so therefore you should every day, every night, 24 seven, work on increasing your professionalism, uh, be it on the diplomatic field, during the meetings, conferences, other play areas, or learning new skills at universities. I would suggest every diplomat, for example, that was always my advice, after two, three, four years, always get back to, uh, to research, to education, uh, to have more analytical uh, abilities. Uh, so these are main ingredients uh, for, becoming, uh, for becoming a diplomat, but without love for your country, without patriotism, nothing works. Thank you, His Excellency. Obviously, there are a lot of questions still, but we don't want to take a lot of time of you. Uh, so if you want, we can conclude our this session. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to sorry on behalf of the ICYF years and on behalf of myself as well, because of the technical issues that we are facing a lot today due to this new era. You, uh, you, you shouldn't be sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. You shouldn't be sorry. I also have technical issues. We all have. Uh, um, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you very much for moderating. I want to thank all the participants. And if whoever has any questions, <coughs> we have our um, emails on our website. We have our social media accounts. Um, anytime uh, anybody can ask any questions. And for Azerbaijani participants, if you have any personal questions, uh, which I can tell only you, uh, I'm always happy because it's our task. Uh, uh, this is what our leadership, leadership of our country put in front of us. They gave us a lot of responsibility to represent our country in the major positions, major postings like Turkey, like NATO and others. And it's my duty, if I, 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 I was given this honor to serve my country, uh, to help also younger generation uh, to be able uh, to serve. So therefore, if you have any questions, please always uh, uh, do it and go through our official channels. Thank you very much. It was an honor for me as well. Thanks, thanks for joining Thank and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, all of you. Thank you.